All right, so good afternoon. This is lecture 19, uh, really ecology of fishes, habitats and adaptations. And so we're gonna talk about marine and freshwater fishes and their distributions in the earth. And then uh, next week, we'll talk about uh, the history of ichthyology and we'll talk about imperiled fishes as well. Um, and so the today's lecture will be freshwater and marine distributions. And so just to give a, a kind of an overview here, there's a couple of odd things to consider. So let me get my pointer. Uh, the first consideration is this. Less than 1% of the water on the surface of the earth is freshwater. And 99% of it is marine. All right, so if you just look at habitat size, uh, marine, marine habitats win. But when we look at the distribution of fish species, it, it's not like only 1% of the species are freshwater and 99% are marine. It's actually, it's kind of skewed. Uh, we have about, what I'd say is of, of our 30,000 species of fishes, about 40% here, 41.2% or 40 on uh, rounding uh, are freshwater. And 60, what I'd say 60% are what I would call marine. So the marine habitat's bigger. There are more marine fishes as far as diversity, but you know, there's a lot more than 1% of the fishes are being freshwater. And so we'll talk about why that might be, but that's one anomaly is that there is tremendous diversity in freshwater habitats, despite the fact that they don't really make up a whole lot of like area. Another interesting thing is when I was talking to you about uh, specializations of fishes, especially like the smultification of salmon, and their ability to adapt to uh, from going from a freshwater environment to a marine environment. And that I said that this was very rare. Only about, I'm gonna say eight or 9% of the fish on the earth are able to say tolerate uh, either freshwater or marine environments. Um, and so these are what we call these urihaline fishes, about 8%. Uh, these, Freshwater fishes and marine fishes are primarily what we call stenohaline, meaning that if they only are designed to live in their habitat. So a freshwater fish, if you put it in a marine environment, dies typically and vice versa, unless it's urihaline. And of these urihaline fishes, most of them actually live in estuaries where they can sort of tolerate a little bit of salt, maybe at the mouth of a river where they can go a little bit upstream and, and, and hang out in the freshwater or go back down then to the interface of the of the ocean and the estuaries, less than 1% of the fishes are like the striped bass or the, uh, uh, the salmons or like the eels or the, or the sea lampreys. The anadromous fishes, for instance, that live in the ocean and then migrate to freshwater rivers to spawn, those are anadromous fishes. Catadromous fishes are kind of like the eels where they live in freshwater rivers and then migrate into the uh, ocean to go to the Sargasso Sea to spawn. Only about le less than 1% of fishes have this behavior. And so when I say it's rare, that's what we're talking about. It's pretty rare. And so this is kind of a remarkable adaptation. Most things are either or. Um, and then when we look then at the distributions of fishes, most fishes in the marine environment, you know, they, they sort of have deep pelagic and deep deep benthic, deep pelagic, shallow cold. That's because fresh waters in comparison to the ocean, the deepest fresh water is not anywhere near the marine conditions. And so we looked at it, marine fishes, most of them live in the shallows of the warm water where there's more productivity and less live here in the deep. But again, interestingly, if 70% of the earth's surface is covered by ocean, right, 99% of the water is ocean. 90% of the ocean surface then overlies water deeper than a thousand meters. All right, this is pretty deep, this, this stuff here. And so the bathy pelagic region, 
you know, thousands of feet deep, make up 75% of the ocean. And therefore, this is, if you're ever on Jeopardy, this is the largest habitat on the face of the earth, is the bathypelagic region of the ocean. Um, but yet, despite this, I'd say uh, a fraction of the fishes actually occupy it. And part of the reason has to do with energy. The closer you are to the surface, the more photosynthesis goes on, the more sunlight is there, the warmer the temperature. There's a lot more activity. The deeper you go, the colder it is. Of course, there's no light down there. There's no photosynthesis. And so it's kind of a tough, it's a tough neighborhood to survive. Um, so that's sort of the uh, breakdown there of marine versus freshwater. And so when we look at why are there so many freshwater fishes then? It's not a large habitat. But a, it is close to the surface. It is kind of warm. Uh, it's shallow, so there's a lot of photosynthesis. And so one of the things here, for instance, is primary productivity. Primary productivity is greater in freshwater compared to marine. If you look at the volume of this freshwater, the fact that it's spread very thinly over the surfaces that it is means that most light penetrates uh, freshwater, so there's photosynthesis there. Whereas it's not penetrating, there's a lot of volume down here, but not a whole lot of sunlight's getting down there. The second is uh, habitat variation. When you're in the ocean, unless you're along the continental shelf, like right along the shoreline, the ocean's pretty much the ocean. I mean, the open ocean is like, it doesn't change. You know, if you're at 100 feet deep in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it's not like there's other places that are 100 feet deep that are any different than where you're already at. You can swim halfway around the earth and it's pretty much the same. So there's not a lot of variation going on in the marine habitat, uh, whereas there's a lot of variation going on in freshwater. You've got lentic systems like rivers and you've got lotic systems like lakes. And these are very different habitats. And also there's a lot of habitat complexity in freshwater systems. And there is in marine as well. Like I said, estuaries are kind of unique. Coral reefs are kind of unique. But generally speaking, we look at a river. A river is dozens of microhabitats all linked together into one system. And so everyone says, oh, fish live in the river. It's not that simple. There are certain areas of the river that are inhabited by endemic species that might not exist 10 or 15 feet down river. So lots of complexity there in loaded systems. So those are some ideas there of why there might be so many freshwater species because Whenever you have complexity in habitat or variation in habitat, that right there is a driving force then for diversity of the animals which inhabit that environment. So I would say this as a general take home message, fish diversity is the greatest in warm tropical waters where primary productivity is the greatest. So at latitudes close to the equator. So when we look at then the, let's talk about freshwater fishes first in this regard. Uh, when we look at freshwater zone geographic regions, uh, there are six here that I give you. Um, the first is this one here, the Nearctic. This is North America and Mexico. Okay. And this is sort of put these, 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 these summaries in, 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 into consideration. So North America and Mexico together have a combined, I'm going to say about 950 species of endemic fishes, so native fishes to this area here. And if we look at the primary uh, types of fishes that live here, we have isocidae, which are like things like the salmons, the trouts, the muscalunge, pikes and pickerels, and things like that. Cold water stuff, but I mean, we're talking about Greenland and Canada and Alaska and things like that, as well as the southeast part of the United States. So cold water fishes. Also popular here in North America are family are members of family Percidae. These are things like the walleye. Uh, again, kind of a cold water fish, the yellow perch, perca flavescens, and also then a large diversity of darters, which are very small riverine species. And they, they're temperate. And then also predominant here is family Centrarchidae. The black basses, such as largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, and the sunfishes, bluegill, green sunfish, red ear sunfish, things like that. So if we look at those families, these, these are, this was predominant here in North America. 
we look at some orders, Cyprinoformes, Cyprinidae, the minnows. Catastomidae, the suckers. Siluriformes, Ictaluridae is the family. This is the uh, catfishes, the bullheads, and the mad toms. And I'm gonna tell you this. When I, when I went through earlier in the class and I told you about the diversity of families and I said that the most diverse family of freshwater fishes is in fact Cyprinidae. Look at, you, you, you see Cyprinidae stamped all over the earth, right? They got a footprint everywhere. Maybe not as much in South America, but Siluriformes does. The catfishes are very widely uh, spread, also very diverse. And so it's, it's kind of like this map here is almost kind of like, if you remember Cyprinidae, Printiformes and Siluriformes, it's that's pretty much what's distributed everywhere. So if you look at the second region here, the Neotropical, South America, Middle America. Now, if we stick with our contention that fish diversity is the greatest in warm tropical waters, here we go. 950 species in North America, which is cool latitudes, uh, northern. Down here in the south, right around the equator, 4,500 species. Okay, is that's the most diverse freshwater fishes in the earth, right? Warm area, high diversity. Uh, the Amazon River, right, is down here. And this is really what accounts for most of this diversity is the Amazon River Basin. 4,500 species. Cichlidae, the cichlids like the tilapias, very dominant in South America, warm water fish, tropical. Also our families, Siluriformes, the catfishes, the gymnotiformes, which are these odd kind of catfishes, you know, the uh, uh, things that are related to things like the electric eel, for instance, and then shirassiformes, uh, the tetras and things like this that are warm water tropical fishes, 200 genera of shirassiformes alone in South America, lots of diversity there. Third region here, Northern Asia and Northern Europe, the Palearctic. Again, keeping with our trend, northern latitudes, not a lot of diversity. Look at 546 species here in the cold tundra. Not a lot of stuff going on here in the freshwater environments for fishes. Uh, but primarily, Isacidae, again, Salmonids, uh, Salmonidae, so trouts, salmons, and also then things like pickerels and pikes and perches and things like that. Here, the perches are family Percidae. These things are very well adapted to the temperate zones. Uh, they like to have a little bit of cool water. They can also tolerate a little bit of warmer water too as they get a little bit Southern in their distribution. Africa is our next uh, geographic region. Number four, again, the equator runs right through in Tebe, Uganda, the cichlidae. I showed you uh, some examples of the Malawi cichlids uh, in the African Rift Lakes. Most is the Darwinian finches, high diversity family cichlidae here in Africa. Again, tropical fish, 2,900 species compared to 500 up here, just a little bit north. The Oriental, India, Southern China, Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, 3,000 species of freshwater fishes. And again, we look at uh, number five here. Again, warm water stuff, predominantly family cichlidae. So look at this, cichlidae, 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 predominate in the tropical areas. Percidae, percidae, percidae. Isacidae, 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 northern. And then centrarchids are kind of a North American thing, man. We sort of have to take pride in our largemouth bass. And if we look at then our orders, uh, like I said, uh, just remember minnows and catfish, and you're pretty good here. Um, <clears throat> they really are the most uh, the, 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 the adapted to across the world as far as um, distributions. So they really have a stranglehold here. And last but not least, Australia. This one always kills me. Everyone thinks of all the crazy wildlife that lives in Australia. And if, it's, if, if you're going to say something ridiculous, it's alive. Where does it live? Got to be from Australia, right? Is this a typo? No. They literally have only two species of freshwater fishes in Australia. The lungfish, which I, 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 you know, the lungfish is pretty crazy. The Australian lungfish and then the bony tongues. That's it. They've got two species. That's it. Now, they have a lot of, of, of marine stuff, right? The Great Barrier Reefs and things like that. But as far as freshwater, really two species. That's it. So least diversity of freshwater fishes in Australia. Kind of crazy.
Now, when we look at North America uh, in more detail, we can break it up into the provinces of North America based upon the major freshwater systems. In this case, these freshwater systems are mostly riverine. They are lentic, or sorry, lotic. So the first one we're gonna talk about here is the Pacific Coastal. The Columbia River, the Claymath River, Sacramento River, uh, also the Snake Rivers up here. And you look here, 61 species in Columbia, 30 species in Claymath, 43 species in Sacramento River. This is the number of endemic species in those freshwater river systems. This is like, uh, I always think the state of Washington, Oregon, things like this up here. Uh, the Great Basin down here, 50 species. Now, this is the, the um, Rocky Mountains sort of run through here. This is the Great Plains. The Rocky Mountains sort of run through here. And so uh, the rivers on the west side of the Rockies then flow towards the Pacific, or in some cases flow south down into Mexico or the Sea of Cortez. Uh, rivers on the east side of the Rockies then flow into the Mississippi River Basin. Here is the Colorado River Basin, 32 species endemic. Rio Grande, number four, down here, running south down into Mexico. 154 species. Again, the further south we go, the more energy in our systems, the warmer it is, the higher our diversity we, we suspect. Mississippi. Now, the Mississippi River Basin is the largest. Uh, I mean, really, the Arctic maybe, if you consider all this stuff up here. But Mississippi River, number five. And it, it stretches all the way from really the northernmost reaches of the United States down to the southernmost reaches uh, in very warm climates, um, the Delta in New Orleans. So cold temperature, warm temperature, a lot of latitudinal variation here. 375 species. The Mississippi River Basin has the most diversity of freshwater fishes in North America. Uh, the Atlantic Coastal, number six, is where North Carolina is at. Again, if we look at the Appalachian Mountains, uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains, however you want to call it, on the uh, east side of the mountain range, we are flowing towards the Atlantic Ocean. West side of the mountain range, we are flowing towards the Mississippi River Basin, and it drains then down here in the Delta at New Orleans. 350 species, uh, many anadromous fishes along here. Very, very high diversity here along the coastal regions in particular. And next lecture, we're going to talk uh, a lot about the diversity of fishes in the northeastern region of the United States, in particular because sadly, many of these fishes are threatened or endangered due to habitat modification. We'll talk about that next week. Number seven, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence. Also, see, I say see Mississippi because uh, we'll talk about it. The, 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 they are, these two regions are physically linked. You know, there's a barrier here. The mountain range is a physical barrier, but here there is a linkage here. So a lot of the species in, in, in region seven are also in region five and vice versa. But this is the Great Lakes. These are lentic systems. Uh, and then the uh, St. Lawrence Riverway then that leads out here into the ocean. Number eight, Hudson Bay, 100 species. The Arctic, look how big the Arctic is. Region number nine, it's huge but only 66 species. Again, keeping with this theme, colder, lower energy systems have less diversity compared to say, look at here, number 10, the Mexican transition, 200 species. This territory is nowhere near as big as number nine, but three times, four times the diversity of fishes. So again, warmer, more diversity, cooler, less diversity. Most diversity in North America, remember, Mississippi River, River Basin. When we look at these lent, these lotic systems, again, riverine systems, uh, well, sorry, continental wars can be divided into two categories, lentic meaning static, lotic meaning uh, a lotic ecosystem is from the Latin meaning lotus to wash, all right? Examples of lotic systems are creeks, streams, rivers, runs, springs, brooks, channels, all sorts of stuff. The following unifying characteristics make the habitat ecology of running waters unique from all other habitats. First is flow is unidirectional. I mean, every now and then crazy things happen like earthquakes that drive water backwards, but generally speaking, it flows downriver, one direction. 
There is a state of continuous physical change. The water is always moving, all right? Water is always flowing by gravity. Uh, there is a high degree of temporal and spatial heterogeneity in all scales, microhabitat availability. So for instance, we have things called riffles. This is a particular habitat, you know, rocks with pebbles that may lead to a pool that's filled with silt, which is a completely different habitat that may then lead to another riffle that may lead to a pool and then maybe a run, an open run in a channel with high flow. All these things are different habitats. One fish might live here, but not here and vice versa. Uh, also, there's habitat variation temporally. There are spring rains, which cause spring floods, you know, flooding into the, the, to the floodplain. Also, the action of rivers flowing causes erosion. So rivers meander and change their paths. So lots of, of variation here temporally. There is variability between lodic river systems. Not all rivers are unique. The Cape Fear River is not at all like the Mississippi River. Not at all. And so the, even though we call them rivers, they're quite different. And the biota are specialized to live with flow conditions. You have to be designed to deal with the water constantly at your back, trying to push you down river. How do you deal with that? You got to figure that out. So with that, I'm going to show you a little, uh, a little thing here that talks about the, 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 these different microhabitats here in rivers. So when you look here is where to find fish in the river, this is more about like just looking at different kinds of microhabitats within a lodic system. And so for instance, this arrow indicates our flow coming downstream here. And so outside bends, we look at this. So when the river or stream curves, the faster water which carries the food moves to the outside of the bend and fish look for food in these bends. So for instance, you might find fish hanging out here, right on the outside part of the bend. Likewise, there's a lot of silt deposition going on here on the inside part of the bend, right? So sometimes fish hang out here outside parts of the bends. If we go down river here a little bit, we can see things like this, where our water flow is coming like this. And we have, for instance, rock or boulder pockets. And again, we're trying to prevent ourselves from being swept downstream. So this boulder is going to provide cover from the continuous flow down river. So you find fish hanging out behind here. So for instance, when flowing water hits rocks and boulders, it splits and goes around the obstruction, creating an area of calm water on the downstream side of the obstruction. So this really provides relief or a place to hide, for instance. So this is another place you might find fish behind these outcrops. Sometimes these structures are visible at the surface. Sometimes they're actually submerged and the water might go over them, but they still provide cover. Eddies, look at this. Sometimes you'll get like a, a, a backwater like this, where the major, the, the major water flow comes in like this. And you might have a little bit of diversion of water flow coming around here that forms these little eddies or pools. And so right behind this outcropping, for instance, a wing dam, you might have a little bit of protection from the current. The current might come around you, but in doing so, it might actually bring you food. And sometimes there's other structures located inside of this eddy. So for instance, when fast moving water flows into a small inlet or eddy, it slows down and creates kind of a small whirlpool here that can bring food in. So you might find fish hanging out here. This is a different habitat than say out here, right? Even though those two habitats might be only a few feet apart, quite different. Likewise, some fish might hang out here at the beginning of that eddy. Here is our riffles. Sometimes that you get into the shallows here where you've got the main channel of the river running like this, the high flow is going like this, but there's a shallow pocket right here that has riffles where you can see maybe pebbles or some kind of stones or structure. And the, that sort of slows down the flow a little bit. And you might find fish hanging out there in, in these riffles. So triangular shaped waves, you can sort of see at the surface where faster water meets slower water, like the riverside edge of a bend or a bay or an eddy. Sometimes it's just the shallows along the side of a river. This is another unique habitat, different from the channel. We go further down, merging currents. 
So a lot of times if you see a fork in the river like this with two uh, tributaries coming together, you'll find fish hanging out here because food is being swept downstream. So flowing water carries food. So when two bodies of flowing water meet, fish will sometimes, they're able to forage twice as effectively here. Right, so they're bet hedging on their ability to capture some. So different habitat as well. So lots of different variation there. And this is just a little bit of a example of that. So when we go back to here, our, our presentation. So lots of variation there. And this then figure, this figure in, in explanation here sort of covers that in a little bit more detail. So freshwater rivers, lodic examples of fishes. Perkids, family Perkidae, darters, walleye, salgers. Ictaluridae, again, the catfishes are pretty successful. Bullheads and mad toms as well, living in the rivers. Centrarchids, sunfishes, black basses, such as uh, you know, bluegill and largemouth bass or smallmouth bass, oftentimes like rivers. Temperate basses, white bass, striped bass, remember they go there to the, in the spring to spawn. Also the yellow bass. Uh, Isakids, northern pikes. Uh, and pickerels. There are riverine uh, muscalunge as well, Eastox, Masconangi, the cyprinids, uh, cyprinidae, carps, minnows, and then the suckers of family Catastomidae. Cyprinodontiforms, things like the mosquito fish, shovel nose, and pallid sturgeons. Lampreys, of course, are mostly riverine, freshwater. Eels, of course, are catadromous, living in freshwater systems and then spawning in the ocean. Gars and bowfin also like rivers. The paddlefish likes rivers and also lots of salmonids, including trouts. Uh, for instance, the, um, the, uh, the brown trouts, rainbow trout, things like this. And the, 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 we're in North Carolina. I, can't, I cannot miss to say brook trout. So there's many different habitats here. Runs, riffles, pools, eddies, bends, forks, erosional siltation zones, uh, floodplains, backwaters, spillways. Spillways are what come after a reservoir or an impoundment is put into place. Also, you can form oxbow lakes. For instance, if this river erodes, for instance, something like this, this, uh, ox this can form an oxbow lake. So it can actually form a lentic system off of a lotic system. So when we look at things like centrarchids are kind of generalist. They can sort of be found all throughout here. Same with the ictalurids. Perkids, darters, for instance, really like these, these riffles or runs where it's uh, no siltation, no sediment, but kind of a clear water running over pebbles or small stones. Whereas things like mad toms uh, of family or uh, ictalurid mad toms can sort of deal with these uh, pools, for instance, that might have more erosion or silt deposition in them. Things like the uh, mosquito fish, sopranodontiforms, kind of like backwaters, they can also go into floodplains. They can tolerate some pretty poor water quality. Uh, also things like gars and bowfin like the backwaters. Fish like paddlefish and sturgeon oftentimes will spawn in floodplains that, that form during the spring when the spring rains come down in the, in the river crests and then floods into the floodplains. This is usually a good spawning area. And then uh, in the summertime, this dries up, but the juveniles then go into the river to live. So a lot of times the spawning habitat is the floodplains. What are some other examples? Isakids, again, can you be any of these, any of these uh, areas? Uh, also things like the, uh, um, the pickerels, for instance, like the chain pickerels do like rivers quite a bit. They also can handle backwaters in swampy areas. So not all species are found in all these different uh, habitats. So this sort of goes over that. So darters, for example, require ripples with clear water and silt-free pebbles. Mad toms like this here can tolerate more silt and inhabit pools. Typically both though occupy a similar ecological niche. They are benthic, usually found in small creeks with not a lot of flow, and they do seek cover, for instance, sometimes around small rocks or in crevices. And when I went over the different families of fishes, I sort of gave you some examples of habitats that they'd be found in. And so you can always refer back to those sort of uh, individual families to get a better understanding of the particular microhabitats that they were found in, because I could go and rehash all that, but it would not be one lecture. 
Shovel nose sturgeons are designed to live in large rivers, oftentimes in the channel, for instance, even where there's high flow rates. But look at the profile of this fish. It can be on kind of a rocky bottom and they're designed so that water flows right over their head. So they're not being swept downstream because they're designed so that the water just passes right over them. And they're primarily a benthic feeder. Again, their mouth is designed to feed off the bottom. Gars can hide in the shallows of pools, in floodplains or swampy marshes that are associated with rivers. And they can feed below spillways. And I also said that, remember, the, the gar has that vascularized swim bladder. They can actually breathe a little bit of air. So they can actually live. You know, they might not like this, but... Uh, they can actually uh, crawl around in really shallow water. Um, in some cases, in marshes where it's not a lot of oxygen in the water, they can gulp air and survive. So lots of different variation here, lots of different adaptations. But to know that even though these two fishes here might uh, um, occupy similar ecological niches, they're found in slightly different microhabitats in the same body of water. So you'll never really see a mad tom encounter a darter unless there's a problem like water pollution or uh, habitat modification, because they're sort of, they like to hang out where they like to hang out, you know, pebbles and maybe silted pools. So with that, I'm gonna show you a video now of catching gars uh, on the other side of a, of a reservoir spillway. And so reservoirs are when they put a, a levee in or an impoundment in on a river to dam it off to create a lake. And so this is the spillway right here this sort of overflow of the lake. This is the levee up here, the lake is up here, and then this is the water coming uh, out through that dam, and this is into then dis discharging into the river. Lots of fish like to hang around here because lots of food comes out. So here we go. First fish of the day, uh, we were catfishing and we saw there's a bunch of gar swimming up here and so we were just got on some little rattle traps and uh, we were throwing in front of them and they were just biting them so here I'll show you what I was there biting on we'll get them back in the water I caught them on this little gold rattle trap so, yep now we're gonna get this guy back in the water all right hey guys I just caught this on the Smithville dam pretty nice one mm -hmm. big teeth his first gar yep I caught him on the Little chrome rattle trap. We'll be back with you in the next one. Hey guys, here's my third gar of the day. See the dam behind us letting out 2,400 cubic feet a second. This is the most water they've let out in 16 years. Oh, there's your mom. Yeah, my mom's living. All right, so. What'd you catch them on? We caught them on the gold rattle trap that I showed you earlier, and uh, we just got a little piece of cut drum. Yep. All right, I'll let them go. <laughs> guys, just caught my. Third gar of the day on the chrome rattle trap again. You want to show them the water? It's releasing 2,400 gallons a second. Still flowing. And then these stuffers right here. Yep, they're coming up. Yep, they're just coming oh, I see up. there's one right there. We'll Alright, guys, just caught my fourth gar on the chrome rattle trap. We'll be back with you. Hey guys, I just got my fourth gar, I think. This time I was using a paddle tail swim bait meant with crappie, but I stuck a little piece of drum on the end. So yeah, I've been just doing that and they have been coming in. Yep. See All you right. next video. So that, <laughs> that gold rattle trap they're talking about there looks just like a gizzard shad uh, or a golden shiner, um, which again are both uh, kind of small forage species that would be present downstream of that or getting swept down, for instance. So <clears throat> that's what they were fishing with. So with that, um, some other habitat considerations and adaptations. Um, for instance, we look at these uh, structures in rivers, for instance, outcroppings or sometimes what we call wing dams. A lot of times the agencies will intentionally pile up stones here to create eddies as habitats for uh, fish. Um, boulders also will do the same thing, create these eddies. If, 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 if prey items are being swept down the channel of the river, then things like uh, smallmouth bass or rainbow trout then sort of hang around behind these structures then to eat them. 
Um, also, paddlefish, they might orient themselves in the channel of the river with their mouths pointed upstream, and they just open their mouths and let the water, the flow of the river, just brings plankton right into their mouth that they feed off of. And we also then talked about how lampreys use this oral suctoral disc to attach themselves to rocks, for instance, to avoid being swept downstream. So again, adaptations to living in uh, lodic systems, which are constantly flowing. We look at uh, boulders and other uh, structures in rivers. For instance, uh, catfishes may lie in wait upstream of a structure uh, near the bottom in the benthos to prey on smaller fishes that struggle then with the current. So if the current's flowing this way over this structure, uh, the fishes might come here to rest and there's a predator right there waiting to eat them. So that's maybe sometimes where like a flathead catfish like this may hang out. They think it's safe there, but it is not. Other predators, for instance, a black bass, uh, smallmouth, or in some cases, trouts, uh, will hang around behind these rock outcroppings. And so when fish get come over these structures, or for instance, invertebrates get swept over, they might lie below here and wait for food. And so again, they're sort of out of the, out of the direct current, but it's bringing them food. And so um, you'll see fishermen, for instance, fishing in these areas. So when we look at uh, the major river systems in the United States, here's the Columbia Snake River up here. There's Sacramento. Here's the Colorado. And let me see, uh, it doesn't, that's the next slide, sorry. Here's the Colorado flowing down to the Sea of Cortez. Uh, here's a Missouri, starting all the way up here in Montana, coming down, meeting up to uh, join the Mississippi River which also includes the Ohio and the Arkansas and the Red River uh, and the Tennessee River. Again, the Tennessee River coming out of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, this is why this is the largest of the river basins, the Mississippi. I also indicated that the, the Illinois River uh, uh, right here connects Lake Michigan to the Mississippi. And so I've got a little star here. This is the Chicago River. This is downtown Chicago. This is coming right out of Lake Michigan. And the Chicago River then feeds into the Illinois River, which then feeds into the Mississippi. So the Lake, Lake Michigan connects to the Mississippi River system, right? This is a point of contention, too, because the, the carps, the Asian carps are coming up. And this is why they don't want them to get in the Great Lakes, because it's a direct connection there through the Chicago River and the Illinois River. Um, really out here in the east, we've got the Savannah, uh, the Susquehanna, and the Hudson. Again, this is the Chesapeake Bay. And then we've got, of course, the, the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway, which then connects all the Great Lakes then to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and notice that like none of the North Carolina rivers even show up. That's because they're there, but they're just pretty small. Um, and so they're nothing compared to the discharge rate of these rivers here. Um, and so when we look at those discharge rates, here we go. Look at this. There is, here is again, the snake, this system here, the Columbia River system, lots of discharge here, all right? And this, this sort of here says average flow in cubic feet per second. So it looks like, I don't know, 200, 250, 300,000 cubic feet per second. Here's the Colorado River. Sadly enough, it no longer runs to the Sea of Cortez. This is the delta of the Colorado River, it's dry, right? There's a lot of water use going on here. And so the river actually doesn't flow any longer. It, it sort of stops. It turns into a dry riverbed somewhere here. Um, here's a Rio Grande, again, uh, discharging into the Gulf of Mexico. And you can sort of see here the North Carolina rivers, but you know the, the thickness of the line sort of indicates the, the discharge rate. The mighty Mississippi, 650,000 cubic feet per second discharge here at the Delta, New Orleans at peak flood season in the spring. And again, here's that, you can sort of see, here's the connection there, Lake Michigan then through the Illinois River to it. But look at this, it starts all the way out here. The Missouri starts all the way out in Montana. So huge river basin here for the Mississippi. And again, here you can see the, the Rocky Mountain Range. And then here you can see the Appalachian Mountain Range Rivers on the west side feeding, or feeding into the Mississippi, 
rivers on the, the, the east side feeding then into the Atlantic Ocean. So the Appalachian mountain range sort of makes this divide. We look then at those major rivers that, that contribute to uh, the, the, the Mississippi River being the largest river in North America. Mississippi, you know, the Chippewa Indians named it Mississippi, which means great river. And so the name is sort of just stuck. It's been a little bit, uh, you know, the French have sort of come up with this, this, this spelling, but it's really the Chippewa Indians had named it. And the four major rivers here, Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio, Arkansas, come together then to form the Mississippi. Those are the four major rivers. Again, it's Montana is the west boundary, Appalachia is on the east boundary. And when you look down here where the Mississippi and Missouri come together, we see then the St. Louis. This is the arch of St. Louis uh, on the river. Um, and then this here is a photo from, I think this is from my home town maybe up here somewhere I grew up right, right south of Chicago and so the Illinois River. Uh, length, uh, 3,302 miles, based in over 1.5 or over 1.1 million square miles. So very large. And again, this one here quotes the average flow rate at, three, at 593 cubic feet per second. Uh, peak floods uh, in the spring, I think it's 650,000 per second. So these are the major rivers to be, to be aware of. And also that the Mississippi River, highest diversity of freshwater fishes in North America. So you, you might need to know that. So we're now gonna talk about lentic freshwater systems. And these are the lakes. So lentic ecosystems are, are what we call near stationary to absolutely still waters. And this is from the Latin word lentis, which means sluggish or slow. Uh, examples include ponds, reservoirs, marsin bas uh, mars uh, basin marshes, ditches, reservoirs, seeps, lakes, and vernal or ephemeral pools, like for instance, floodplains, which are temporary. Uh, temperature regimes, this is an interesting thing about lakes. Uh, and so it, there's a lot of variation in the lodic habitats, like riffles and, and pools and things like that. There are actually habitat variations within lakes as well, although there, there's not as many. So uh, for instance, if we look at a thermal stratification, and so this sort of shows a, a lake in the springtime when things are just warming up, the water is maybe about four degrees centigrade universally distributed with good mixing throughout this in the spring. So as air temperatures increase in the spring, you know, the ice melts and the reservoir does what we call turnover. It mixes. Now, as it approaches summer, the, the warm air will warm the uppermost layer of the water and allow for good mixing up here. And so this top layer might be 20 degrees centigrade, for instance, in the summer. But this layer interfaces well with the atmosphere, but doesn't really mix well with this bottom layer. And there's a line here called a thermocline, which differentiates these two layers. And so this upper layer is called an epilimnion, and the lower layer is called a hypolimnion. Epi is above, hypo is below. And so the things to remember is this. The epilimnion is warm, oxygenated water. The hypolimnion is cool, less oxygen water. So what we found here is that you just now created two different habitats, warm water fish, and cool water fish. Now, this occurs throughout the summer. And then in the fall, when the air temperature decreases, this upper warm layer will cool to about the temperature of the bottom layer and then they'll start to mix. And this is called fall turnover. Uh, and what happens is, is those two water layers will mix. And so those habitats are then collapsed together to form one habitat again. Um, sometimes in the fall, you can taste this in, in drinking water. When your drinking water reservoir turns over, it can taste muddy or like algae. And sometimes the municipalities will add like chlorine to the water to help the uh, flavor there. Uh, but that's what's going on is that when, when this turns over, all this muck on the bottom sort of gets pulled up into the water column and, and, and gives it the water that off taste. 
And sometimes then in the winter, you know, you'll have an ice layer form and you'll get a little bit of a thermocline here, but this really isn't like a lot of, this is not a whole lot of uh, uh, habitat differentiation. Really this, this, this is what goes on during the summer. So you do have a little bit of differentiation there. And so if I was a student studying for this class for an exam, so to speak, I might be familiar with thermal stratification. So thermal stratification affects the amount of oxygen present in the different zones. So the upper zone has oxygen, the lower zone has less oxygen. And this is for a couple of reasons. The first is this epilimnion at the top is oxygen rich because it circulates and it mixes with the atmosphere, right? Oxygen can dissolve into it from the, from the air. Also, sunlight penetrates this upper layer in what we call the photic zone. This photic zone is where the sunlight can penetrate. And we talked earlier about how sunlight attenuates and there is no sunlight in the deep water, it, it attenuates. So only photosynthesis is going on up here and photosynthesis produces oxygen. So that's also how we get oxygen up here. So the near shore photic zone is called the uh, littoral zone. So this is the shoreline in the shallows is the littoral zone. And offshore a little bit is the limnetic zone in the shallows. And that is in, in contrast to this hyperlimnion or hypolimnion that forms where there's not a lot of circulation, it's kind of cold, not a lot of oxygen down here. So fewer primary producers exist in this hypolimnion because it's in what we call the profundal zone or the aphotic zone, the no light zone. So there's less oxygen and it also doesn't really mix with this upper zone the epilimnion. So additionally, accumulation of decaying vegetation and uh, organic matter further reduces the amount then of oxygen because it really consumes oxygen. And so you'll find some fishes that like it down here. Catfish love it down here. Bluegill, largemouth bass love it up here. So lots of different variation there on where you might find fish based upon this chemistry. So Freshwater fishes, lake fishes, lentic systems, what you might find. Again, hypo or uh, 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 epilimnion warm, hypolimnion cool. Euphotic, oxygen, aphotic, not a lot of oxygen. So lake sturgeon might be found in this limnetic zone, a little bit offshore, open water. But they're kind of cold water fish, so they can be down here. Perkids, walleye, salger, and perch, limnetic, right? It's oftentimes also a photo because walleye sort of live on the bottom. They've got those reflective eyes with that tapetum lucidum in it. Uh, they like to see low light conditions in the cool. So they're down here. Ictalurids are benthic. They can actually be down here, but they can also be up here in the weeds. A lot of times they like to forage down in the muck. They're benthic. Centrarchids, sunfish, black basses, crappies, littoral, sometimes in the limnetic zone, sometimes largemouth bass will cruise around out here along the weed line to see stuff. But a lot of times things like uh, bluegill like to hide amongst the weeds. Maronids, uh, the temperate basses, things like hybrid striped bass, white perch and striped bass, sometimes out here in the limnetic zone. Sometimes they'll come in here, but they really don't like to be in the weeds. They like to sort of maybe hang around outside to see if there's something there to eat. Esockids, northern pike, muscalunge, and pickerels uh, oftentimes are cool water, limnetic. Cyprinids, the cy family Cyprinidae, they're all over the world. They could be, they, they don't really care. They're found everywhere. They, they don't have a preference. Common carp are found anywhere here. Shads, Euphotic zone near, near the surface, limnetic. Remember a lot of clupeids, uh, family clupeidae are in fact planktivores. They eat on plankton, which again, plankton's up here. Salmonids, uh, trouts, smelts, chars, limnetic zone up here. And then the bowfin is in the benthos, hanging out with the catfish. They like to be down here. So those are where some of these, these fishes, and again, this is amiidae, the monotypic family, amia calva, the bowfin. So I'm gonna move on now to talk about the Great Lakes. Uh, as the quintessential lentic systems, the Laurentian Great Lakes. Now, uh, 
I know that we're in North Carolina, so a lot of people might not have ever seen one of the Great Lakes. And so I want to give you a sort of a picture here of how amazing these things are. Laurentian Great Lakes, Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, and Ontario. These are geologically young glacial lakes. They were formed about 10 to, 20, uh, 10 to 12,000 years ago when the glaciers that used to cover North America receded and in doing so literally carved them out. They contain 20% of all the world's surface freshwater and 84% of all the freshwater in North America. Right here. All five lakes form a single basin naturally interconnected all fresh water here in, in green. And then if I was a student studying for an exam, I might wanna know that if the outlet here is the St. Lawrence River dumping into the Atlantic Ocean, water flows from Superior to Huron, Michigan, then to Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, then to the St. Lawrence River. Might wanna know that. Also then here, Lake Michigan again connects through Chicago to the Mississippi. So there's a little bit of a trickle coming out of there. But most of the water flowing through this system goes through the St. Lawrence to the Atlantic Ocean. Now these lakes are huge. They are immense. I mean, these are not like Jordan Lake. These are like, uh, they're like, like seas. They, they literally are seas. So if we look at these things, uh, here's the surface area, here's the water volume, elevation, maximum depth. Lake Superior, 1,300 feet deep. Okay, these are not, these are, these are lakes. Okay, surface area of uh, Lake Erie is 9.9 is or 9.9, 0.9 thousand uh, square miles. Lake Superior, 31,700 square miles of the surface area. Now, the entire state of North Carolina is only 53,800 square miles. That means that Lake Superior is more than half the size of the entire state of North Carolina. And it's just, it's a body of water. Maximum dip, 1,300 feet. Average depth is 483 feet. Very deep lakes, very cold. Lake Erie is by far the shallowest, only 62 feet deep on average. Uh, maximum depth is only 210 feet. This is the shallowest of lakes. And so when I say water flows through these lakes based upon gravity, this is what I'm talking about. Look at the elevation here. And this is, this is distance in miles to the outlet, the ocean here at the Gulf of the St. Lawrence. And then this is elevation. So Superior is at an elevation of about 601 feet above sea level. That water then flows out into Lake Huron and then Michigan. Michigan is, is deeper than Huron. And then the, these lakes are at a slightly higher elevation compared to Lake Erie. And so water then flows down by gravity into Lake Erie. And then I told you the Welland Canal was built that bypasses Niagara Falls. Look at this. Niagara Falls is, in, is an elevation 210 feet. So when I say sea lampreys can't swim up that, that's pretty tough. Water then flows down from Lake Erie into Ontario, which Ontario itself is a pretty deep lake, 802 feet. Uh, the Welland Canal then bypasses this. And then from Ontario, it then flows into the St. Lawrence Seaway. And all these, these black boxes here are some kind of impoundment or levee that sort of helps regulate water flow, okay? So the river has some water flow uh, regulation on it. But these are the elevations of the different lakes to show they are flowing down by gravity. And to know Lake Superior to Huron, Michigan, Erie, and then Ontario, right? And really the water coming out of Superior goes into both Lake Huron and Michigan at the same time, okay? So those are your Great Lakes. These are not little lakes, these are lakes. So here is a time-lapse image of the ice flows on Lake Michigan. 
I mean, these are like outright ice flows. When we call them ice flows, I'm talking like, I mean, th these lakes ice over, like you've got like many inches of ice. And this is the great city of Chicago, which, you know, I, I can make a Chicago Bears joke here. Uh, you know, seeing that my graduate student who was harvesting fish with us yesterday decided to wear a Green Bay Packers sweatshirt, but it's okay. Uh, it's okay. Uh, this is the city of Chicago and these are the ice flows going over it. And, you know, every year people go out fishing for uh, pikes uh, and walleye and things like that on the ice flows. And so this is Chicago in January and that ice is flowing. Um, you could walk in, in, in really cold freezes, you can walk out on it. Uh, and you could go ice fishing, and I've got a video of that right now. Now, but it's it's not a Chicago video. It's uh, you have to guess where it's from. You can put it in the chat. Uh, I sort of gave a hint to it, but um, this is Chicago, and these lakes are huge. You cannot see across them. Uh, the visibility you cannot see across them. They are ginormous. They have unique weather patterns on them, and all these lakes are unique to themselves. Lake Michigan is not the same as Lake Erie, is not the same as Lake Ontario, so they are very unique, uh, and they are massive. So with that, I'm going to show you a video here of ice fishing for northern pike. Here we go. kind of wait for this spool to stop spinning which tells us that the fish is done running we don't want to let them swallow it so we don't give it to them for too long now let's go ahead kind of hold the line feel for the resistance of the fish and then give it a nice little hook set like that just pull it in nice and easy hand over hand you got to remember that you don't have a rod or nothing so you got to be kind of gentle with how you play them so you don't rip the hook out or break the line. It's actually a pretty decent fish. Yeah, it looked like it. It's not fighting super hard. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, this is a good fish here. Really putting up a putting up a fight. Get a look at that fish, man. That is a good fish right there. We just got set up. Actually, we're not even set up. We're still working on the last couple tip-ups. This is a beauty. This is what we're out here after. This is why we come out here. This big old northern pike is just roaming this shallow flat. We just got set up. We're gonna get a lot more throughout the day, I can guarantee that. He's a feisty one. I'm gonna go ahead and put this one back in the water so it can get even bigger. Maybe we'll catch him next year. I'm gonna show you now the setup that we're using, which is it's just a simple uh, tip-up setup, but I'll show you exactly how I do it. I've got my uh, got my tip up spooled up with um, 80 pound Dacron line, and then I'm using a uh, 50 or 60. I think it's a 60 pound fluorocarbon leader that's 10 inches long here. Fluorocarbon, in my opinion, is the best uh, leader material because it's super clear underwater, but it's also really resistant to teeth. So that 60 pound fluorocarbon is an awesome leader, and then I also put usually a little bead and a tiny little blade on there just for a little added attraction especially in this murky water this uh, chartreuse bead seems to work pretty good so since we're only fishing in a couple feet of water i'm only letting out a little bit of line it's early ice we've only got four to six inches of ice or so so i'm just running out you know 15 to 18 inches of line here i want to keep it right up under the ice and i'm just gonna go ahead and hook my minnow on 
One of the things that you can try to do with your minnow that works pretty good sometimes is instead of just hooking in, in the back by the dorsal fin, you can come on the side here, use your the side of your hook to scrape off some of the scales so that way the hook can penetrate nice. And then you want to just barely run the point of that hook under the skin, not puncture any of their um, vital organs or anything, and just run it right under the skin like that in the side. And what this does for you is as he's swimming, the weight of the hook will constantly be trying to turn him upside down and since they don't want to be that upside down, they're going to be always fighting against the weight of that hook to keep themselves right side up. So that's just a way to keep your minnow swimming instead of just getting docile under there. So then all we do, put the flag under, everything's all set, put it in the hole, and we wait for one to bite. There's a lot of different suits on the market right now, all designed for the ice fishermen and the outdoorsmen. Most are very well made, very well designed, but the suit I'm wearing today is a little All right, that just devolves into an advertisement. So there's a hint in there with the grilling sausages and things like that. As far as, you know, you might be from uh, Wisconsin, if you can reach into ice water to pull a northern pike out with your bare hand in the middle of winter. Um, that water's pretty cold. You know, I used to spawn muskies when I was doing my master's degree project. And yeah, that's like six degrees centigrade water. Uh, I'm going to say maybe four degrees centigrade, a very cold water. So not, not very good on the skin. Um, so with that, I got one last slide here on some of the uh, uh, North Carolina freshwater systems, uh, geographical regions. And I'm going to give you a story. So <clears throat> we look at uh, the, the, geographical regions of North Carolina. We've got the coastal plains, we've got Piedmont, and then we got, you know, the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, also, you know, out here in the coastal plains, we do have the Outer Banks. And so what I like to say here is, this is marine, freshwater, and urihaline fishes out here in these estuaries. Here we have cold water coming out of the mountains, things like trout. And then here we have our traditional warm freshwater fishes. And so there's a lot of diversity here, like, you know, to be honest, you can just find a lot of different fishes in North Carolina, just simply based on the geography of the state. Uh, not a lot of states have this, so it's kind of unique in that regard. Also, there are four major river systems. Uh, the Roanoke, uh, Albemarle Sound system, which is what I would consider a low salinity system. This here is from USGS. It's like about a, uh, anywhere from zero to a half a part per thousand salinity here, maybe as much as five parts per thousand salinity. Then we have intermediate salinity estuary system, which is the Tarnus, the Tarnus Pam, Tarnus Pamlico Sound. Uh, and then we have the high salinity river system here, which is the Cape Fear, which literally this, this river dumps straight into the Atlantic Ocean. So this is sort of a, a, some interesting differences here that these three sound, these two sounds are different, uh, as well as then the mouth of the Cape Fear. So even though we have rivers dumping into the ocean here at different points of the state, they're all quite different habitats. And so that's North Carolina. And so with that, I have a story. Now, just like last time, because we're a week off, this one's typically supposed to be done about a week from now. But I'm giving it now because that's what we gotta do. So you learned it here, AEC 441, Lake Gitchagumi. Now, I talked to you, the, the Great Lakes are massive, right? These, like, they're, they might as well call them the, the freshwater seas or whatever of North America. They are not out there. They're like, I mean, people talk about lakes, but these are the Great Lakes. So <clears throat> the first inhabitants of the Great Lakes Basin arrived 6,000 or more years ago and the Chippewa Indians 
just like they called the Mississippi River the Great River, they called uh, Lake Superior Gitchigami, which meant the Great Sea. Now, the Native Americans established communities throughout the Great Lakes Basin as there were abundant resources such as wild game, uh, fertile soils, plentiful water, uh, ability to go hunting, to do agriculture, also to go fishing. Importantly, the region also contained copper deposits, which were mined and made into implements like tools. The lakes and the tributaries also provided for transportation. You know, for instance, canoes, you could put, you could put boats in the water. And so the lakes are just as important today as they were back then. Now, the Chippewa Indians had respected Lake Superior for its fierce weather patterns. Now, when I say lakes, again, these things are huge. You cannot see across them. If you get in a canoe and start trying to go across Lake Superior, you might as well go across the Atlantic Ocean. You're going to not make it. They're huge. And likewise, just like the ocean, tremendous storms can form on the Great Lakes as well. So the Indians believe that there are water gods and evil spirits called Manitous that were within the lake for whom they then paid homage to by casting ornaments and tobacco into the water uh, as a sacrifice. For example, spirits that made fogs that engulfed canoes that were never before seen again, uh, they would then make an offering afterwards to prevent that from happening again, because that kind of stuff happened quite frequently. So poor weather condition has claimed many a ship on Lake Superior, even in modern times. The SS Edmund Fitzgerald, many of you may have heard of this, is one of the most famous stories in, in the Great Lakes region. Um, it was a famous freighter that sank in near hurricane conditions, literally a hurricane formed on Lake, Mich uh, Lake Superior. Hurricane with freezing rain, November 10th, 1975. So 45-year anniversary of the sinking of this ship is right around the time you guys are taking exam three. So think about that. The ship sank with the loss of the entire crew of 29. Now, this was the largest ship, 729 feet length, to have sunk in North, Carol uh, North America's Great Lakes. And I believe to this day, it is one of the largest ships to have sunk of, on U.S. waters uh, in, in a hurricane on Lake Superior. So to give you an idea, again, of the scale of these ecosystems, they are impressive. The captain of the Fitzgerald, McSorley, last radio message was, we are holding our own. No bodies were ever recovered from this wreckage. And the Chippewa Indians, the legend is said, Lake Superior never gives up its dead. So here's a video. An air and sea search is continuing for possible survivors of the Edmund Fitzgerald, a 729-foot oar carrier which apparently broke apart and sunk last night on Lake Superior. The ship and its 29-man crew vanished in a storm with 80-mile-an-hour winds and wave heights up to 25 feet. All that has been found is an oil slick and some debris. The legend lives on from the Chippewa down Up the big lake they call get sugar made. Lake it is a never gives up for dead when the skies of November turn gloomy. With the load of iron ore, 26,000 tons more than the Edmund Fitzgerald weighed empty. The big ship and crew was a bummed a bit chewed when the gales of November came. The ship was the pride of the American side, coming back from some mill in Wisconsin. As the big freighters go, it was bigger than most, with the growing good Captain Wellsey's end. Concluding some terms with a couple of steel firms when they left for a loaded quickly flat. Later that night, when the ship's bell rang, 
seemed to be the north wind they'd been feeling. The wind and the wild made a tattle till sun. So that is 
Lake Ichigumi. Um, the very famous story of the Evans Fitzgerald and also tying it to uh, the earliest of the inhabitants around it, the Chippewa Indians. Um, and to say that these lakes are immense. So with that, I will stop recording and entertain.